uh, Naz Ahmad, and um, thank you for joining us today. What we're going to run through today is B1 cell biology, right? So we're going to do part one today and we're going to do part two uh, in a few weeks time. So if you want to know what the sessions are that are coming up, they're available on the website, but they're also available through the Instagram page. What we're going to look at today is uh, cell structures. Now, the first thing that you need to understand is that all living things carry out seven basic processes. So there are seven liv living processes that all living things do. Um, the first one, or rather the way to remember that, that acronym is something that you guys would have done in primary school is Mrs. Nerg. Now, the first thing that we need to look at, or the first thing that's going to be part of your course is the structure of an animal cell. Now, in an animal cell, there are various different parts. Um, one of the first things that you need to know is, uh, so there's five parts, five, this is how you're going to remember it. There's five in an animal cell, and then there's three extra, or there's eight in a plant cell that you need to know off by heart. The first one is nucleus, then you've got the cell membrane, then you've got the cytoplasm, mitochondria, and the ribosomes, okay? So those are the five parts in all animal cells, or most animal cells, not all animal cells. So the nucleus contains the genetic material. The genetic material is the DNA of a cell that allows it to reproduce. So if I want to make a copy, it's essentially the instructions of that cell. You've then got the cell membrane. Now the cell membrane controls what enters and what leaves the cell. So you've got initially, if you think of the cell membrane as this is the cell membrane, um, that bit there. So this whole thing is a cell membrane. Um, what's going to happen is eventually over a period of time, these uh, particles that will diffuse across the cell membrane eventually and till they reach an equal uh, concentration on both sides of the cell membrane. And then finally, last thing you need to know is the cytoplasm. Now the cytoplasm is essentially where most of the chemical reactions take place. Not respiration, not photosynthesis, but most of the other ones um, that need to take place inside a cell will take place in the cell in the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is kind of like a jelly-like structure. Um, if you think of a uh, water balloon filled with jelly, essentially it holds the cell together, but not to a great degree. It's not as strong as say, for example, what we'll look at later today, uh, cell wall. Now, um, the two other parts that you need to know is the mitochondria and the ribosomes. Now, the mitochondria are where you've got your respiration taking place. Respiration or aerobic respiration is the process of releasing energy from glucose using oxygen. It's something that we'll look at in later sessions, but at the moment, what you need to know is the mitochondria is where aerobic respiration takes place. And then the ribosomes is are, sorry, where proteins are synthesized. So proteins are made, all of our structures in our body predominantly are made from proteins. And those are all in the ribosomes, or rather they're made by the ribosomes. What the ribosomes do is they take the DNA, the DNA has the code for making the proteins, and then it will create the protein based on that code. That's why our DNA is so important. Patrick, first place. Um, the next thing we need to get our heads around is plant cells. Okay, so how are plants of uh, organelles? Organelles are what are inside the cells. How are organelles linked to their function? Um, so again, you've got the five things that are inside all animal cells. So if you list them off in your head, you've got the nucleus, you've got the cell membrane, you've got the cytoplasm, you've got the mitochondria, and then you've got the ribosomes. Now, the three additional parts of a plant cell are the cell wall, the chloroplast, and the vacuole. So you've got so you've got the cell wall, the vacuole, and the chloroplast. So how do we get uh, how, kind of what is the function of each of those three things? The chloroplast is where photosynthesis takes place. Now this is the equation for photosynthesis. Um, this is something again that we'll go into in a bit more detail um, later on in later sessions. However, that's what you need to understand. Animal cells do not have chloroplasts because they cannot carry out photosynthesis. Um, 
you've also got the vacuole. The vacuole is kind of a nutrient store for the cell. It also is responsible for maintaining the internal pressure of the cell. So if you think of a kind of balloon, um, if the balloon hasn't got enough water in it and you push down in it, you can move the shape around the balloon quite easily. If the balloon is full of water, it's harder to push down on the balloon and therefore it maintains its shape slightly better. Now that the vacuole in combination with the cell wall is what gives plant, plant cells their structure. So the cell wall is made of cellulose um, and that is really important. It is made of cellulose and it strengthens the cell and gives it shape. It is not what is used to uh, allow things into and out of the cell. Now, the cell wall and the cell membrane typically are the two things that students really get confused. Now, if I go back to this then, so this is the structure of a plant cell. These are all the different things are inside a plant cell. Um, you've got the nucleus, which contains the genetic material. You've got the mitochondria, where aerobic respiration happens. Um, you've got the chloroplast, uh, where, no, that's not right. That's photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes place. Uh, ribosomes where proteins are synthesized, vacuole which contains cell sap, uh, maintains the internal pressure of the cell, you've got the cytoplasm where most of the chemical reactions happen and then you've got cell wall made of cellulose and then the cell membrane. Again remember please don't get these two things confused, those are two that are most commonly confused by students. So the cell membrane and the cell wall. Now the ones that aren't necessarily revised as much are bacterial cells. Now eukaryotic cells this is really important. This is a word that you need to know. Eukaryotic cells are cells that have a clearly defined. Oh, let's change the color. Have a clearly defined nucleus. So eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. Now the way to remember it is you, um, as in me or you. We have uh, eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are cells that do not possess a clearly defined nucleus. So things like bacteria cells do not, even though they're living things, they do not possess a nucleus. And they have some slightly different structures. So notice that in the bacterial cells, there is no nucleus that you need to remember. There is a nucleoid, and I know that sounds very similar, but it's just a kind of a ball of DNA or a bundle of DNA. Um, or bundle of genetic material. Now, um, the two that are kind of highlighted, uh, murian cell wall and a cell capsule. So it's not the same. It's not made from cellulose like they are in plant cells. In, in bacterial cells, they are made from murian. Uh, the second thing is a cell capsule. So this is kind of like a slime capsule and it covers the outside of a bacterial cell. And the reason part of the reason why we use hand wash is because it breaks down the cell wall and it breaks down the cell slope capsule of bacterial cells which burst the cell open. Now um, they contain some things that are relatively straightforward and some things that are very common to both things. So let's have a look at this. And remember the seven living processes, Mrs. Nerg, uh, movement, reproduction, sensitivity, nutrition, excretion, respiration and growth. Bacterial cells, because they're singular, typically singular celled organisms, they have to do all those things by themselves and therefore each part of the bacterial cell is there to um, carry out a specific function. So you've got the cell membrane um, and the cell membrane again very similar to kind of what normal cell membranes do. Um, so let's go through this. So a cell membrane controls what goes in and out of the cell. Um, nutrients have to be taken in and waste materials are excreted through the cell membrane. It doesn't have lungs um, in order to do the exchange processes. It has to do it all through the cell membrane. So that is how it gets its nutrition and that is how it excretes. So notice the blue color of the cell membrane links to the two processes of Mrs. Nerg, which uh, bacterial cells need to do. The next bit is plasmid DNA. Plasmid DNA are small loops of DNA and these can be transferred between bacteria. So this is how um, antibiotic immunity arises. Um, it's small bits of DNA which allow 
exchange between bacteria which causes allows them to evolve and adapt um, usually transfer genes that provide a genetic advantage so if something provides if a plasmid or the coding of a plasmid provides genetic advantage then it gets transferred those two things are again reproduction and sensitivity so sensitivity is responding to the environment um, you've got the flagellum, uh, it's for movement, but it's also there for sensitivity, it responds to the environment. You've got rib ribosomes, which are there to uh, protein, synthesize proteins, which again um, is used to grow, similar, exactly the same as animal cells and plant cells. Um, it has cytoplasm. Now, the cytoplasm is where uh, respiration takes place, where all the chemical reactions for a bacterial cell need to take place. Um, and then the final one is chromosomal DNA, and that controls the cell's activities and replication. So notice where I've highlighted reproduction in green, um, chromosomal DNA will also be used for reproduction. And let's crack on. So, so far we've been talking about general cells, right? We've been talking about cells um, and kind of the, the bog standard, right? This is the type of cell that we've got. However, there's a big difference between what we call stem cells and specialized cells. So, um, if you talk about um, cell differentiation, when we start off, all cells will start off embryonically as stem cells. What that means is, is when uh, sperm fertilizes an egg, all the cells that will be there will be stem cells. In other words, they are essentially like students in a classroom or in a school. And over time, they will, uh, bits of the DNA will be turned on, off and therefore they will adapt to become something called specialized cells. So exactly like uh, students in a school, um, when students are in school, they've got the potential to become um, any type of cell. And then when they specialize for whatever reason, they can become a teacher, a doctor, a pilot, or even like a you know, YouTube star, uh, TikTok star, TikTok star. I think it's TikTok star. Um, if you haven't worked out, I'm not very cool, um, but it's all good. It's all good. Uh, so let's have a look at this then. Uh, what does that mean? So what do the following terms mean? Now, let's Fantastic. Right. So uh, stem cell is an undifferentiated cell, an unspecialized cell that can differentiate into uh, several different types of cells. Now, there are two types of stem cells. We will look at them in more detail. Um, the two types of cells are embryonic uh, stem cells and adult stem cells. So embryonic stem cells are can turn into the full range of cells that are found in human adults. Um, Ironically, adult stem cells can only turn into a few different types of cells, such as red blood cells, white blood cells, etc. Differentiation, uh, someone's answered that already. Differentiation is the process of a stem cell becoming a specialized cell. And then finally, um, specialized cells are cells that are adapted to carry out a particular function. Now, one of the things that you guys will be asked to do is apply this to various different examples of a specialized cell. So if we take a sperm cell, for example, a sperm cell, um, the function of a sperm cell is to reach and fertilize the egg. So how does it achieve that function? What features, what structures does it have that allow it to uh, carry out its function? It's got a tail, it's got a middle section full of mitochondria, it's got acrosomes, and it's got an haploid nucleus. Now we'll talk about each one of those in a second, but the key thing that you need to get your head around is that, well done, uh, brilliant. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat uh, to see people's responses. Uh, so you have to link the feature of to the function of the cell. So you have to link the particular structure to the function of the cell. Now, um, the way I think about this is, uh, I think about it in terms of a football boot. So a football boot is specifically designed to play football. Hence why, um, if you think about the function of it, is to run on grass and to kick a ball. So how does that break down? So you've got various different features of a football boot, which allow it to achieve its function. So you've got studs, which allow you, give you better grip on the grass. You've got 
uh, they're generally speaking, they're quite light, um, which require less energy to run. They're hardened at the front, so they're protecting the feet um, and they're cushioned at the bottom. Um, that's a picture of me uh, many, many, many years ago now um, in uh, getting ready for a football match. Now, how does that link to a sperm cell? So again, remember the function is to reach and fertilize the egg cell. So what features does it have? The tail. So tail essentially is there to help it swim. Um, middle section is full of mitochondria. Again, why do we need mitochondria? What is the function of mitochondria? Well, it's where predominantly aerobic respiration takes place. So it's full respiration and it releases energy. Um, it's got acrosomes in the head. Acrosomes are um, a digestive enzyme, which, sorry, acrosomes contain digestive enzymes, which um, break down the outer casing of the egg cell. Um, allowing the nucleus to make its way to the nucleus of the egg cell um, and it's got a nucleus so therefore uh, it contains half the dna uh, a haploid nucleus now a haploid nucleus is half the chromosomes of a particular cell so for example if you take in humans we've got uh 46 chromosomes um so 23 pairs in a sperm cell you would only find 23 chromosomes um and you'd also find 23 in the egg cell now how does that break down in terms of questions so i'm going to ask you to use the chat again uh not for all of them but just for the final question so first one how do the mitochondria these are examples of actual exam questions how do the mitochondria help the sperm to carry out its function so again think about how or it might be an explain question or describe question um describe how mitochondria help the sperm to carry out its function ultimately you need to talk about uh respir it contains a large amount of uh mitochondria so that oh my bad. So this middle section full of mitochondria is the description. Um, if it asks you to explain, um, then you would then add that mitochondria are where respiration takes place and that releases energy for the sperm to travel to the egg. Um, the nucleus of the sperm is cell is different from the nucleus of body cells give one way in which the nucleus is different well we kind of talked about this already in typical adult human cells we've got how many 46 chromosomes whereas in a uh, nucleus we've only got 23 chromosomes of a sperm cell sorry in a nucleus of a sperm cell we've only got 23 chromosomes let me be absolutely clear now um, typically, both of those are one mark each. Now, the last question I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to do in the chat. So, um, question three. It doesn't matter which two you choose, and I'll leave the information on the screen, um, but try as best as you can to... Sperm cells are one example of a specialized cell. You've got various different examples of specialized cells that you will need to know for the exam. Um, I've got focused on the animal cells for today. We'll do the plant cells next lesson. Uh, but essentially, these are all kind of relatively, again, it's what is the function? What is the structure? How does the structure help? Those three questions are typically what you need to ask every single time. Um, so egg cells, uh, egg cells uh, will have a cytoplasm. They'll have a haploid nucleus. Again, haploid nucleus being one where they've got um, one where uh, they've got half the amount of chromosomes as compared to a regular adult cell and then the uh, cell membrane which again like normal cells will allow substances to enter and exit the cell so what is the function of a egg cell it carries female dna and feeds the developing embryo it's got nutrients in the cytoplasm uh, Again, think about why it would need nutrients. It's got a haploid nucleus. Again, think about why it would need a haploid nucleus. And it's got um, a changing cell membrane. Uh, and again, think about why it might need that. So you have to, have to, have to, especially if they ask you to explain, you have to link um, the function to, sorry, the structure to the function. Uh, tail helps it swim and the mitochondria releases and supplies the energy needed for it to move. Well done. Uh, someone else has just answered in the chat. So let's have a look at the egg cells then. Uh, so cytoplasm contains nutrients needed for growth, e.g. amino acids and glucose. Uh, haploid nucleus contains half 
the chromosomes of a normal body cell and then the cell membrane changes structure after fertilization with the sperm takes uh, when the fertilization takes place with the sperm. So the reason I've kind of included the last one is very important. This stops any more sperm from entering the cell, uh, egg cell, um, to fertilize it once the first cell has made its way through. So the way it works is very simply, um, you've got a sperm cell which kind of is uh, swimming its way making its way to the egg cell it will be absorbed after that there's a change that takes place in the cell membrane which further stops any other cell from entering the uh, egg cell and therefore if another sperm cell should arrive uh, it won't be um, it can't make its way in basically long story short um, so very quickly if you want to take a screenshot this is what you need to take a screenshot for these are the structures of a egg cell and the function or the reasoning behind why they need those particular um structures right okay let's crack on so um in terms of uh the last one that you need to know is or rather in animal cells the ones that one that typically comes up is epithelial cells um not to say that these are all of the cells that can potentially come up. Um, there are things like red blood cells, etc., which can come up. Um, so you've got the sperm cell. Now the sperm cell uh, we've covered, the egg cell we've covered. Uh, the last one is epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are cells that line the surfaces of your body. They are found on your skin. So your skin is an example of an epithelial cell, blood vessels, urinary tract, and organs. So uh you've got different types of epithelial cells um the typical one that you will need to know about is the simple columnar epithelium so that is typically inside your uh sorry let's go back that is typically inside your bronchi um your urine tubes and inside the uterus and they've got these extensions on the surface so these extensions here uh oh They've got these extensions, which are there to serve multiple functions. Um, essentially, what they do is they are they're called cilia, and the cilia increase the surface area, but also they can beat. Uh, what that means is they waft. Um, so, how do I explain this? Um, let's do this. Right, cool. So they do this. Uh, they go. They waft like that and they waft in time with each other and so what that does if you picture that happening under water uh what that does is it provides a kind of a current um of the fluid inside various things say for example your fallopian tubes which move substances inside along that's one of the key things that's one of the biggest ones that you need to know right patrick ishan and surathi absolutely smashed it well done so um let's minimize this now um we haven't got long left we've got about 10 minutes uh let's see what we can get through so uh development of the microscopes this is the last bit that we're going to cover today um in terms of uh, diffusion osmosis and everything else we will cover next week so um early microscopes they were light based microscopes sorry i'm just going to drink some water Don't judge me. I stole my um my daughter's Peppa Pig flask. Um, so early microscopes uh around created around 1590, um, and those become and later, many many years later, in 1942, we kind of I say we, not me personally, um, but people came up with the first electron scanning microscope. Now, um, there's a few key differences that you need to know between the two. So, um, they have a, electron microscopes have a much much higher magnification ability. Um, they also have a much higher resolution. That means that we can study uh, cells in much finer detail, and we can observe. Cells subcellular structures okay so typically with a light microscope there's a few things that you need to know so you need to know where the eyepiece is you need to know where the objective lens is now think about it the eyepiece lens is where your eye goes yeah the objective lens is where the object goes You've got the stage, which is where you will put the slide, um, and then you've got various different focusing knobs on the side. So these things here, they're just uh, 
focusing knobs. Um, so ultimately, whenever you use a microscope, one of the things that you may be asked is how to set up a microscope. Um, you set up your slide using uh, whatever sample you have. You put a cover slip on. You then put it onto your stage. And then you need to zoom out to the widest field of view. The reason you do that, if you think of playing a video game, uh, if you played a video game um, and you are, say, for example, you've got a sniper rifle, you would start from as far back as possible. The reason being is if you start in from a zoomed location, it is very hard to pick out the detail that you want to pick out. So you start with the widest field, view, field of view. Um, and the second thing I need to kind of highlight at this point is to work out the total magnification. What you have to do is you have to take the magnification of the uh eyepiece lens and multiply it by the objective lens so say for example your eyepiece lens was times five and your objective lens was times 20 your total magnification would be the two of those multiplied together so your actual magnification would be times 100 um so if your eyepiece lens is uh, times 10 and your objective lens is times 40 commit to the answer write it down on a scrap piece of paper or whatever it might be um so what is the the total magnification is going to be times 400. Now, to work out, uh, the other thing that you need to know is um, when you are using mag microscope, um, you can look at the, or you can work out the real size. Oh, not bad. You can work out the real size of a particular object based on if you know the magnification and the image size. The image size is obviously what you are measuring um, and the real size is what uh, the actual size of the structure is. So how do I do that? Well, I can put it into my triangle and say, right, OK, so the magnification is so the image size is going to be there. Your magnification. This doesn't want to work. Magnification is going to be there, and then the real size will be there. Now, um, based on that, this is what I'd like you to do. Ooh, no, take a screenshot of this, and um, you can have a go at this in your own time. I'm just conscious of time, um, and then we can review this, or I will post the answers on uh, next lesson. Yeah? <laughs> So have a screenshot of this. Uh, so again, the equation is I over magnification multiplied by real size. The only thing that you need to be conscious of uh, when you are doing these calculations is the image size and the real size. Um, they need to be in the same units. So for example, if you say how many orders, if you look at question two, how many orders of magnification between one centimeter and one micrometer, um, you need to convert them to the same uh, prefix, in other words, either turn them both into centimeters or turn them both into micrometers. Typically, easier would be to go for the smaller, um, smaller unit. So a micrometer is smaller than a centimeter, so it's easier to work it out if you convert one centimeter into a micrometer. But how do you do that? Well, you typically, oh no, you typically, oh strange slides are repeating uh you will turn them into a uh, standard form um so for example if you want to go from centimeters to micrometers you've got to times a number by 10,000 or oh, one 10,000 um so you've got to times it by 10 to the power of six so you can and we'll look at this in more detail i don't want to rush it um but i just wanted to make you aware of it so one thing i will say is prior to the next biology session or prior to any session really um you need to learn these prefixes off the top of your head um this is absolutely important and this is going to be a big game changer when it comes to physics when it comes to chemistry when it comes to biology especially biology when it comes to um looking at micro Scope. So biology, you will be focusing on these ones, whereas in physics, typically you might be focusing on these ones here. OK, right. Um, ladies and gents, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. If you're not following on the Instagram page, please follow on the Instagram page. Um, I am going to look at or rather I'm going to contact. So I'm going to give away three prizes this week um, and they are going to be three £25 vouchers um, to the students that have engaged well. Um, 
I'm going to ring parents and kind of ask them what platform you would like the vouchers for. Um, I'm going to choose them at random. I've got four head, four names in my head. I'm going to use a random uh, generator to work out which three people deserve those vouchers. So thank you very much for joining. Join me next week. We are going to be looking at atomic structure. So we're going to be focusing on chemistry um, and then we'll take it from there. Hopefully you had a good lesson. Hopefully you found it useful. Peace.